It's not easy living in close quarters with lots of hungry people in the middle of winter. For the Yellow Jackets, that's just the tip of the iceberg, and most of Season 2's second episode did a serviceable job of showing how these things were starting to draw them apart. Taking a dump in the pea bucket is not something they're going to let slide, and by the end of the episode, they're in desperate need of something to bring them back together. There was another back and forth between Shauna and Still Dead Jackie that ended with the former telling the latter to stop, and Jackie reminding her that she was the one holding the knife. The whole dynamic exists inside her head, and there's a lot of that going down throughout the episode. You're hungry. Yeah, Mari's making dinner. If you could stop moving, it's not what you're hungry for. In the case of Ty, things are happening that she doesn't quite understand. Adult Lottie seems to be less than honest about things she's seen, and Travis is experiencing what is at least spiritual, if not supernatural. Coming into this season, I think that was what I was most excited to see. How the different characters would react to these things that will inevitably happen, and what they do to try to make sense of the horrors we imagine are coming their way. Based on that, it's kind of refreshing that we got to the act of cannibalism so soon. We knew it was coming, and actually that a much worse version is still on the horizon. So let's get to it, and see how they grapple with it after the fact. Also, the way it was shot and cut with this hedonistic, Greek or Roman looking feast, hints at a sort of a group delusion of how they're processing what amounts to a not that surprising choice they make given the circumstances. Surprising or not, there is a major social taboo that is built into eating human flesh, and it's one that Coach Ben isn't ready to overlook at this point in the story. That shoots him up to the top of the list of characters we don't expect to survive this ordeal, possibly overtaking Steve as the one who feels like they're in the most immediate danger. On top of that, there was so much other stuff that happened in Edible Complex. Almost too much, to the point that I had a little trouble deciding on how to put this recap together. I decided to jump around in time and try to stick to each of the characters, though I'm gonna have to do a little bit of jumping around around there too, and I think it makes sense to start with Misty since the interesting stuff that's happening with her is somewhat disconnected from what's happening in the rest of the episode. In 1996, we don't get a ton of Misty. We see that her friendship with Crystal is blooming. We sort of see them hanging around in the background in the shots around the cabin. Imari delivers the comment that, oh great, there are two of you now, to show that other people are picking up on this new bond that they're developing. Other than that, you might take her question about it being girl or boy poop as a clue that she's the one who is the guilty party, but overall most of what we see is about how everyone in the cabin is getting tired of living together. In the present day, things are a lot more exciting. We get our first look at her fellow citizen detective putting the sick in forensics. Misty made a post on the show's equivalent of Reddit asking for hacking help to find out if the security camera she discovered outside of Nat's room in the last episode recorded anything. Elijah Wood's character, who's named Walter according to IMDB, responds by saying he can help her out, but only if she stops shitting on his Adam Martin theories. This leads to another great faux Reddit moment as she fires off her reply and then instantly realizes she makes a mistake, so she has to struggle through the anxiety over whether or not she should edit it. Walter then shows up at her work and manages to sneak a note into the refrigerator so she'll discover it when she goes to grab her lunch. Bubble baths, walks in the rain, muscular calves. <laughs> Because we know who he is and Misty doesn't, this all comes off as a cute cat and mouse sort of thing, but I'm super curious as to how he found out where she worked and where she puts her lunchbox and what all that means about who he is and how Misty got on his radar. I mean, I suppose it's possible that the downvote triggered him to the point of borderline stalking her, but Misty is also famous from the plane crash, so there could be more going on. The note is written in invisible ink, so she doesn't figure that part out until later. After decoding it, it tells her he thinks the camera's a dummy, and sets up what I imagine is an incredibly exciting meetup for Misty, to go interview a man that's been staying at the hotel for three months. That man might be Randy, since we saw that he was basically living there in season one, and that's interesting because he's one of the few people alive that knows about Jeff's involvement in the blackmail. He also knows Misty, though, 
So I'm not sure how any of that would actually play out. But as I said, this is all extremely up Misty's alley. The common interest in being citizen detectives, his internet prowess and potential hacking skills, and a date that involves impersonating law enforcement to collect information for a case. So it's a great setup that the whole thing starts with her being in opposition to him because he's looking into Adam, which is based on her wanting to protect Shauna. All of this should go a long way toward keeping Misty's present day timeline interesting though. Speaking of Adam and Shauna, the local law enforcement officer and childhood friend of Natalie, Kevin Tan, stops by her home looking for information about Adam. They have texts or at least records that they were texting each other, so he has some questions. Shauna decides to lie, which doesn't seem like a great idea, and has to be saved by Callie, who interrupts their conversation. She's still working through her feelings related to finding the remains of Adam's ID in the barbecue, and heads to a local bar to do some day drinking where she engages in some flirting with a new character who turns out to be Kevin's partner. He sets her up by floating a fake story about his parents, and gets the information he was looking for when she confirms that her mother was having an affair. Things aren't looking great for the Sadekis, and Jeff doesn't appear in this episode at all. Things are also not looking great for Thaisa in either timeline. In the past, the man with no eyes makes an appearance and almost leads her off a cliff while she's sleepwalking. Fan wakes up and notices she's gone in time to track her down and wake her up before it's too late. I wouldn't say this is an answer to what's going on with Ty, but it does feel like a revelation. You can't even say for sure that it was leading her to her death, let alone say if it's connected to any of the other unexplained stuff we've been seeing. And it does stand out that we see the symbol on the tree after she gets up. What's more important though is how Ty reacts, and in some ways overcompensates for not being able to understand what's happening. Van suggests that she go to Lottie, and she rejects that out of hand. And she even goes as far as telling Van that she doesn't want her to talk to her either. In the present, she tries so hard to stay awake through coffee and just general sleep deprivation that she either hallucinates that Sammy came to the house, or she falls asleep and the bad one takes over. Either way, she calls Simone who comes over to find out Sammy isn't there. They notice that his bedroom window is open, so they go searching, but get a call from his school to say he's been waiting there the whole time. Simone tells her she needs help, and then Ty scowls at her before running the light and driving into an accident in the intersection. The other car hits Simone's side, but it's not exactly clear if this is something Ty did on purpose, or which Ty was driving at that moment. The sound design catches your attention because as Ty is making the crazy face, Simone continues saying, I won't let you be his mother like this, but you can barely hear it. It also cuts back to show the scenes with Sammy again to show that she was alone the whole time, and there was another scene earlier where she was looking in the mirror, and the reflection is sort of doing its own thing. Again, it looks like the bad one is acting independently of her. Exactly what's happening is never clear, and maybe it never will be, but it all reinforces the idea that it's not something she can choose to ignore, and that Simone is probably right that not seeking help is a mistake. Another character who made what feels like a big mistake this week is Team Nat. Although part of her motivations are rooted in good intentions, the other part is rooted in her dislike of Lottie's emerging role in shaping the group's decisions, and the way that Travis has this newfound interest in Nat. I think there will be more revealed and that Natalie's feelings go beyond simple teenage jealousy, but we see that that does exist when she's watching them through the window. When they go on their hunt, Nat brings it up and when Travis doesn't take Take her side, they make a decision to split up. This gives her the chance to put her plan into action. She cuts her leg and puts the blood on a pair of hobbies pants that she brought with her and then shows them to Travis, telling him that she found them hanging from a branch. Since Javi should be dead, you can understand where she's coming from. She wants to give him closure so that he can move on. But based on everything else that's happening, you have to imagine that this will end up causing her problems. It does create this situation where she can be there for him, and it brings them together to share this moment. They even have sex that night back at the cabin. But given that Lottie tells him she still feels Javi's alive, and that Travis has visions of her while they're making love, it all feels like like it's leading to further complications. The visions of Lottie in the room with them are strange. Because it's happening at this intimate moment, it comes off as a desire for her sexually at first, 
But when you look at it closer, he's not engaging with her in that way. What works about this for me is that Natalie's trying to give Travis something she thinks he needs. But he's responding more to the faith that Lottie is offering him and wanting to believe that Hobby's still alive. You see that a little bit in their conversation when they're hiking and her response is to try to fix things in the way that makes the most sense to her. As mentioned, I do think there's some garden variety jealousy at play, but I also think Nat is jealous because she fears that Lottie can give Travis something she can't. In that sense, it's not romantic or sexual. It's about getting through this incredibly difficult time and trying to live a life rather than just surviving. It's about trying to make sense of things you can't explain, and if Nat believes the way to do that is through their bond, through the connection that they have, you can understand why she would be opposed to him seeking spiritual solutions through Lottie. In the end, those visions hint that he'll likely head in that direction, so her fabricating the evidence of Hobby's demise feels like it will be the catalyst for a split between them. Beyond her interactions with Travis and Nat in the real world and his visions, there's not a lot going on with Lottie in the past in this episode. I did think it stood out that a lot of members seemed to look to her as a leader, though. At different points when things come up, it seemed like the group waited for her opinion before they made any decisions. In the present, we get a better idea of what kind of person she's become. There's a short scene on the grounds of her compound where she's talking to Nat that presents a contrast between what she says and what you see. Nat accuses her of leading a cult, which it sure looks like that's what she's doing. But she disagrees, saying that she runs an intentional community, turning suffering into strength so they can live as their best selves. The whole conversation continues this way. It's heliotrope, not purple. She sent people to watch Nat, not kidnap her, and so on. All the while, she's wearing a gold Rolex and tosses out a drink that her follower messed up after one sip. It all establishes she's gifted in her ability to spin things, and unsurprisingly, Nat isn't buying into it. As promised, she does tell her what she knows about Travis, saying he called her the night he died convinced the wilderness was calling him, and the only way to make it stop was to get as close as possible to death. He believes that when Van and Lottie almost died, they saw something, and he wants that too. This part at least seems plausible, and I think this and their earlier conversation together set the stage for a story that we should expect is not entirely true. For example, after she calms him down by putting her hand on his chest, she says she thought she got through to him and that she only wished she hadn't fallen asleep. At this point, Nat asks why she didn't call her, and she responds that she brought it up but that Travis said not to because she would only make things worse. The way she delivers this seems suspect because it seems insensitive toward Nat, who she's supposedly trying to help. It feels like a small lie, or at least a twisting, and it makes you wonder how much of what she says you should believe. What she says is that she woke up and found him missing. He left his bank account information and the note that said tell Nat she was right. She then went to where he worked and he had arranged candles in the shape of the symbol and was going to lift himself by the neck using a crane until he passed out. He tells her that he needs her help to get back down but if she refuses he'll just do it himself. Again, this might all be plausible. It's a terrible plan, but nothing about Travis's situation says he's making good decisions. She does agree to help and says that as soon as he goes unconscious, she'll lower him back down. What she tells Nat is that the button stuck when she tried to do that. What we see is that happens and she panics, although it jumps out right away that he's close to the ground compared to where he was when Natalie and Misty discovered him in season one. While this is going on, we hear Laura Lee saying, put your face faith in him, your guiding light, and she has a vision where you see her during her baptism in the lake intercut with images of Laura Lee that day, and then a staggering version of her walking towards Lottie. At first this is a soothing experience, but then Laura Lee sort of decomposes in real time and Lottie starts to scream. There's a quick flash of a bloody character's face on the screen, and then when she looks back at Travis, he's now up in the air as high as when Nat found him. At the very least, Lottie is withholding everything about the vision she had from Nat, but she could also be twisting the details about Travis's death. The fact that she didn't contact her at all and just sent people to watch her instead doesn't really make sense considering they hadn't been staying in touch. I 
guess based on their conversation, she had been keeping track of her, at least how many times she's been in rehab. But I think we need to know more about what happened in the past before any of Lottie's present day motivations will become clear. Nat doesn't believe she's telling her everything and says that she's going to put a stop to what's happening, but learns that she can't leave. Lottie, who I guess technically goes by Charlotte now, even though I'm not going to start calling her that unless there's a good reason to, tells her she'll have to stay the night and that at least she'll be safe. Then she goes back to her room where she's not impressed with the heliotrope clothes they leave for her, and when she falls asleep briefly, we see some flashes of what looks like an EMT bringing her back from what is most likely an OD. There are two men there with an oxygen mask in the foreground, and when they move, you can see what looks like Travis behind them. I don't know what else to say about this, except it brings to mind what Travis said about a near-death experience, and since it's from her point of view, it seems like Natalie probably had one. That's pretty much everything that's going on in the present day, so let's go back to the past for the main course. I mentioned that Shauna was continuing to talk with Jackie's corpse, and she convinced her to braid her hair to cover up the fact that she was missing an ear. This leads to doing her makeup, and that leads to Ty freaking out when she sees her. It's kind of funny how bad this looks, but also kind of sad since Jackie's ghost was taunting her for being useless behind a mirror and us knowing that this is essentially Shauna talking to herself. There was a brief divide in how frightening a thing this is for Shauna to be doing. Lottie was sympathetic and Ty was not, which makes sense. Ty can't control her sleepwalking or confront it in a healthy way, so you can see how she might want to control or try to control what other people are doing and lash out at something as freaky as this. They eventually decide to burn the body because the ground is still frozen and that's the reason they didn't bury her in the first place. There's a lot of great acting throughout these sequences and you do feel for Shauna even though you know she'd cut a piece of Jackie's arm off and probably ate that too. They build a pyre which makes you wonder how Van might feel about that and then Akila suggests saving the jacket which, all things considered, seems like a good idea. Shauna protests this, though, because if they took the jacket off, then they would see what she did to her arm. And then she goes full mama bear protecting her cubs mode to back everyone else off. Lottie does see the cut on the arm and helps her cover it up, and then removes her heart necklace and gives it to Shauna. Of course, we know this will make a future appearance around the pit girl's neck, so now we can see how it circulates amongst the survivors. Nat and Travis return, and a fight breaks out, because Lottie is still convinced that Javi's still alive, despite the fact that they're carrying those bloody shredded pants. So Shauna grabs the torch and gets ready to burn her best friend's body. She says some words, and it really hit me when she says that she'll never have another friend like her, because it underlines the fact that you do only have those kinds of relationships when you're at that age. She is losing a piece of herself here, and even though the group has lost so much by this point, it is another layer of their innocence slipping away. They all walk inside, but we only get to see what Travis and Nat get up to. While they're together and he's having visions of Lottie, the camera moves through the forest in a way that suggests that there's an unseen force at play. There's basically a perfectly placed gust of wind that dislodges snow from the branches that covered Jackie's burning body. I suppose this turns the cremation into a smoking, and the smell of a roasted body wakes everyone up. To their credit, they contemplate what they're about to do even for a while after Shauna says she wants us to. We see that she makes the first move, and through the intercut banquet scene, we see that they start off tentatively before letting loose and giving into the gorging. You get the impression that everyone partakes except for Coach Ben, who looks horrified and walks away and closes the door behind him. That puts him in the outgroup of what I think is just him. I think he's the only member. At the banquet table, I think we only see the named characters from season one, but I do think you see the character named Jen that they introduced in last week's episode come out of the cabin when the others do. And I can't think of a good reason why they wouldn't be included in the cannibalism, so I'll assume they were unless we find out something different. I guess this works. I saw some people saying that this was a great way to show what was happening without the gore, and that kind of just made me think that maybe you're watching the wrong show. Maybe don't pick the one that opens with the cast hunting down one of their teammates and eating them. My first thought when I saw these images in the teasers, and sort of the way I imagined it going in, was that it would somehow be sanitary from their perspective. Not like we can't see this because it's too graphic, but, you know, they can't really 
process the truth of what's happening. Like they're replacing a brutal truth with something more palatable. And they do actually get fairly savage while looking downright gluttonous. But gluttony in regards to fruit and wine is something altogether different than Jackie meat. I don't think it was a bad choice necessarily. I just think it's silly if the cannibalism show doesn't think its fan base is okay with seeing cannibalism. That's why I think if it works, it works because of the way we choose to make sense of things and just sort of how we remember, how memories work and what we decide to hold on to. This seems to line up with Nat saying that Travis never believed in any of this stuff in season one. Because after this episode, it's clear he believed in some of it and maybe a lot of it if you believe adult logic. Which makes me think that when she said that, what she was really saying is what she chooses to believe and remember about how he felt. It's a thing that everyone does to some extent, even if you've never been in a survival situation. I think there are a lot of interesting places they can go from there, and I would be excited to see them lean into this idea of memory and a general inability to deal with reality, or just exploring the way the different characters react to whatever they're experiencing and all of that kind of stuff. Plus, there's a lot of other stuff that might not be clear yet, like it's possible that Ty was the bad one whenever this happened and she'll wake up and be horrified by what happened. So I don't want to come off like I'm not optimistic about where this might go. Because overall, as I said, I'm glad they got there so that we can see what this does to them as a group. And I think most of what didn't work leading up to the big moment might work better when we see how things come together. Because I was thinking we were watching the group splinter apart. I wasn't expecting this situation to arise that would bring them back together. The thing I didn't like was the shot where the camera swoops in before the snow falls onto the body. It made it feel like it would be very hard to show something like that and then pull back and say, well, actually there's nothing supernatural going on here at all. They didn't go as far as confirming that's why the snow fell in such a way that perfectly sets things up so that they could cross that line. It could be an act of God or whatever, but I don't know why you would choose to present it that way if that was the case. I suppose it might have come off as funny if you just saw the snow drop from above, but this looked like something made it happen. And I'm not opposed to the idea of going down the supernatural route, especially if they have a good explanation for that. I've just been enjoying that tension that is there whenever you don't know if it's one way or the other. And now it feels like it's a little bit of a different show. What locks that down is it wasn't from any of the characters' point of view. It was something that just existed for us to see as the viewer. Otherwise, I enjoyed it. It was nice to see the man with no eyes. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on between Teen Nat and Travis and how Lottie fits into that. That makes the adult Lottie and Nat stuff a lot more interesting. The Misty Reddit stuff was maybe too relatable. When she left out the word wild before goose chases, I thought to myself, I get it. The word before it started with the W2, so I totally see how she skipped right over that. Super excited to see where Elijah Wood's character fits in and how that changes what's going on in the adult Misty time. Line. I wasn't familiar with the word heliotrope, so I looked that up and noticed that there's an old surveying instrument that has that same name. There might be some clues there, which I'll try to look at before I make my next video. I thought it was interesting that they mentioned that Shauna was seven months pregnant, and that that means they have probably about a year left in the wilderness before they get rescued. And I'm curious to find out who took the dump in the pee bucket. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and thanks for watching, I'll talk to you soon.